Welcome back 2021ers. This lecture will begin our discussion of the memory system and its general architecture on most modern computing platforms. If you're following along at home, you'll want to start having a look at chapter 6 in Bryant and O'Halloran. This goes into some detail on the memory system and we'll follow the discussion there somewhat more closely than we did for the computer architecture part of it. Although we'll relate the discussion back to some code issues and some demonstration programs uh, that you'll want to have a look at as well. Those are in the code pack and we'll probably start fairly early examining them. Our goals in general are to discuss how the memory architecture affects performance. And generally, you'll need to understand access patterns to memories uh, and what kinds of delays this can create. Uh, one common data structure that you'll see in standard programs associated with this is two-dimensional arrays or matrices, as they're sometimes called. And so we'll first have to establish what the layout in C programs looks like uh, when you go to two-dimensional arrays. Uh, this will lead us to discuss some timing issues as you do various things with those 2D arrays uh, and lead to discussion of how to write generally memory-efficient programs. Uh, we'll deal with some more fine-grained topics as we move ahead in that because part of the memory efficiency uh, deals with understanding the different levels in the hierarchy of the memory system. As you are wrapping up this week, you'll want to have a look at homework 9, which deals with timing loops and observing the pipeline and superscale effects that show up in processors. A lot of this is also going to have play later on as we discuss memory efficiency, but the homework 9 codes deal almost exclusively with items that are already in the CPU, uh, as in doing arithmetic on registers only. As you would need to feed the processor more values that are coming out of main memory, this is where some lags can be introduced. Uh, so we'll build upon the timing experience that are being done in that uh, set of codes uh, and start incorporating more memory memory operations uh, relatively quickly. Our uh, project four will be posted probably sometime this coming week and will involve some optimizations uh, and analysis of why certain programs are or aren't efficient. You'll probably be provided with an inefficient version of some matrix type computation and be tasked with improving its efficiency and also with analyzing some code to explain why in some cases it runs faster uh, than in other cases. So let's begin. Uh, as promised, uh, we have been discussing architectural issues up to this point. And so I want to contrast first what we'll talk about later uh, with some immediate things that should be starting to be familiar with you. Uh, that my expectation after our discussion of architecture is that you'd be able to relate a feature of the arch architecture to little code loops like this and explain why one or the other of these two loops would run faster than the others. And if you look closely, uh, you'll see they're both tight. Uh, they both loop one at a time and go for the same number of iterations. But a couple of things should jump out at you that prior to our discussion of architecture uh, may not have uh, that explain why in most cases you'd expect uh, on a platform either these run at the same speed or loop one runs faster. And generally, this is on account of one of the architectural features, uh, the pipelining feature, uh, or superscalar features of a processor that dictate if you're adding to two separate memory locations, which will probably be two separate registers in a type loop like this, then these two addition instructions, they don't interfere with each other. Uh, they don't create any hazards in a pipeline. And if there are superscalar aspects of the processor, for instance, two arithmetic logic units with two sets of adding circuitry, uh, then these two uh, additions can either be stacked closely or done completely in parallel by utilizing both those ALUs. Whereas in the second loop, since I'm adding twice but to the same memory location, uh, probably a register in this case again, uh, the results of the first add have to be completed before adding on to it in order to get the correct results. Uh, this generally interferes with both pipelining uh, and isn't as easy to use in a superscalar processor, so performance suffers on that front. Moving ahead, we're going to start dealing with things that are off chip from the CPU. And to that end, we'll start looking at main memory as this thing that is separate from the CPU and has to communicate across the computing system, usually across the motherboard in order to gain access to it. 
Uh, an easy way to start to grasp this is to look at large-ish pieces of data. And since our assignment's probably going to focus on two-dimensional arrays, now is a good time uh, to introduce them and discuss them. Uh, there are a couple ways, actually three or four ways, that you can lay out two-dimensional data in C, but all of them have to deal with this central issue with two-dimensional objects uh, in that memory itself is just one big one-dimensional array. Essentially, most DRAM chips are this one-dimensional entity where you have a memory address 1024, 1025, uh, up to 2048, up to 3096, up to 16 or 32 gigabytes if you have the money to buy bigger chips on that front. Uh, that essentially means that any two-dimensional object must be embedded into this one-dimensional memory. As in, uh, I have two indices in your standard uh, 2D table, uh, and you'd access them as uh, a row and a column in most C programs. Uh, but in reality, main memory only has one index uh, into it. And so the memory address that's computed here uh, will in some way reflect how you embed this 2D table uh, into a 1D column or row. Uh, so what's illustrated here in these left and right parts of the slide are two ways that are commonly used to lay out two-dimensional data in C. Uh, if you trace along on the left-hand side, you'll see first that there's a single malloc here, and the malloc that initiates this mallocs some number of row elements, uh, and the size of those elements is the size of an integer pointer. And so this, as a pointer type, is probably on a 64-bit system, a 64-bit or 8-byte quantity. And however many rows I need, in this case 100, I'll need 100 pointers, essentially. Uh, the second part of this then goes into a loop, uh, and for each of those 100 pointers, that's the first index in the row, it mallocs uh, an entire row that's comprised of however many columns I have, 30 in this case, times however big the element I have, and that, uh, that's the size of an int. Uh, if I actually want to access then individual elements, it's a two-dimensional index, an I row and Jth column that gets me one thing that I can assign to it or extract from it. And you'll see down at the bottom then uh, to counterpart uh, this uh, repeated malloc up here uh, for each of the rows, I need to have a loop that repeatedly frees uh, each of those rows, ultimately freeing up uh, the uh, column of uh, row pointers, as it were. As an alternative to that, uh, over on the right-hand side here, uh, you will see first a malloc, similar to the left-hand side, but in the second case, a malloc that is uh, quite different in nature, uh, that mallocs the entirety of how many elements I need, uh, rows by columns, uh, so that's uh, 30 by 100, that's 30,000, uh, and that's times the size of an integer, so it's four would be, uh, let's see, it was that 3,000 by four bytes, so 1,200 bytes or so. Uh, that block then, uh, I'll go through and establish pointers to individual spots in it. Uh, and your task for the moment to sort of understand how this code works uh, more viscerally is to draw a picture of what the left-hand side arrangement for this 2D array in one-dimensional um, um, one dimensional memory looks like compared to the right-hand side, what the two-dimensional uh, entity looks like when it's embedded in one, D one dimension uh, using this malloc scheme instead. Both of these are fairly common, uh, and both have some pluses and minuses associated with them. Uh, and neither of them actually reflects exactly how we're going to do things on come project time, but they're a stepping stone towards that. So take a moment, and if you can, draw on a piece of paper what you think each of these will look like. I'll pause for just a moment, give you a chance to do that. And we'll resume by moving forward to have a look at what I think are reasonably good constructions of what uh, pictorial representations of this would look like. Uh, so the first left-hand column, which had repeated mallocs, uh, will first allocate this uh, sort of array of row pointers, as we'll call it, and then proceeds to establish, using separate mallocs, a bunch of rows. Uh, a row here, a row there, a row there. Importantly, each of these are separate asks for 30 elements uh, and four bytes per element because they're integers. So that's a whole bunch of asks repeatedly for 120 bytes. 
These two parts are connected in that the zeroth row pointer here points at some block of 120 bytes that can hold those 30 integers. The oneth row points at some other block that's elsewhere that can also ho hold uh, 30 uh, integers uh, and so on down the line up to uh, row 99, which has some block over here, also 120 bytes that can hold that. Um, so you think of this then as a bunch of small ass to malloc. That the first one's you know reasonably sized, 100 by uh, 8 bytes per pointer, uh, but each of these is then a small ask. And importantly, one of the things that we'll come to learn about the malloc system is that it can put these 30 uh, sort of elements wherever it sees fit, so long as the 30 elements themselves are contiguous. So in truth, the arrangement of this thing might actually be the zeroth row here points to some high address uh, that is. Uh, uh, up here, uh, so I could actually rearrange each of these three pointers that the zeroth one points up here, uh, the oneth one uh, points down here, and the toothth one is still pointing in the middle. Uh, and this would still be a valid way for malloc to answer those calls uh, based on its internal implementation, something that hopefully we'll become acquainted with later on if we have time to implement it ourselves. The big difference then, if you look back and compare uh, this first approach, which used a loop with repeated mallocs, uh, is that in the second approach, I have one big malloc here, and then a bunch of pointer arithmetic to point uh, some of these row pointers into the midst of this uh, big block of memory. And to distinguish that then, down here in the sort of two malloc approach, uh, rather than the repeated mallocs, I have one malloc to get the row pointers, and then someplace in, else in memory, I have this extremely large block of 3,000 bytes, uh, or say 12,000 uh, 12, yeah, 12, bytes uh, that constitute the 3,000 elements that could be in this two-dimensional uh, array. And importantly, they are contiguous, uh, that as I would go from 0 up to 29, uh, that's the first row, immediately after that in memory is elements uh, 30 to 59, and immediately after that are elements 60 and, and on upwards. So this is one big ask to Malik to find me a single contiguous hunk that is big enough for all of my elements. And then I will just go about doing some pointer arithmetic to point these zeroth elements uh, to uh, the row pointers to the appropriate row, uh, point this one pointer into the midst of that, and so on down the line. This gives me a quick way to access any of these rows individually, uh, but importantly, I'm guaranteed based on that one big malloc that they're all stacked next to each other uh, in memory that if I were to end one row, the next most immediately following address is going to be part of a row one, and the next higher address after the last element of row one is uh, going to be part of row two. That's not guaranteed in this earlier malloc uh, set of calls because each malloc call itself is free to place these rows wherever it is that the memory allocator sees fit. So uh, that's a first and important difference. And what we're gonna rely upon is contiguous layout of memory here. So that as I go across one row, the most, next most immediate uh, element is gonna be part of row two. Uh, this is gonna factor in then to a lot of what we do later and be dependent on it. Um, so you can presume a picture looks more like this guy. In fact, uh, we can actually uh, sort of cut out the middleman on that uh, part, uh, let's see. Uh, and that uh, the actual implementation we're going to use in most of our project land um, cuts out the second malloc entirely, that we'll have essentially a single malloc. And what that you can boil down to more or less is the following, that my matrix or 2D array of uh, elements, uh, table elements here, is essentially one big malloc to say all the rows and all the columns times however big the elements are, allocate all of them together in one fell swoop. Uh, so if I had uh, that, such a thing uh, that's out there, I could actually calculate by hand where a, an individual element, uh, for instance, uh, row 5, column 20 is located, just by doing a little bit of arithmetic. Uh, and that's uh, if I multiply my row number, 5 uh, in this case, by however many columns there are in it, uh, that allows me to scan ahead. If it's 5, it'll uh, be 5 times 30 in this case. That'll land me at element 150. 
Uh, that's where the start of that fifth row is at. Uh, and then if I go a few elements in, that gets me uh, into the appropriate column here. So 20th column, for instance, that'd be element 120 or uh, 170 of this big giant uh, array. Uh, and that actually corresponds to, if it were uh, it's sort of brought back from what's one dimensional embedding in the 2D array uh, as row five, uh, column 20. To make that a little bit more palatable, uh, what we'll probably introduce is a little matrix data structure. This is just a struct. Uh, all it has in it uh, is uh, a pointer to a matrix over here and then a recording of how many rows and calls are in it. And then we'll introduce some little macros uh, that just do the math for you. So you can use something that looks sort of like a function call here, like an mget to say, get me the fifth uh, row, 20th column here, uh, and that will translate into C code that just indexes uh, this data array that's associated with this struct uh, and does the math for you uh, to compute uh, the element that, that's present there. Um, so uh, to that end, look forward to making use of those in the not too distant future. And as computer scientists often do, we'll use some little monikers here uh, to abstract away from the specific implementation, and make it easier to say, I want the IJF element to uh, either get or set it uh, to 55 in this case. Uh, and you don't need to think too hard on that part, just make use of the provided macros for it. So then another point that I think bears a little bit of discussion here is just that you can envision there is not just one approach to this 2D embedding problem of here's this table uh, that has rows and columns. How do I get it into a one dimensional uh, array? The um, uh, approach that C takes is similar to many other modern programming languages, uh, Java and Python and OCaml for instance. They all take this row major embedding where the things that appear contiguous in one-dimensional memory uh, are the rows of a two-dimensional entity. And so uh, if you were to walk through memory, uh, as we laid out in our earlier pictures, you'd see the elements of row zero first, that's one, two, three, and then immediately after it would be elements of row one, four, five, six, and then elements of row two, seven, eight, nine. Uh, the technical term for this is row major ordering um, for the, the in memory of those 2D ma matrices. Now that isn't the only game in town, uh, as there's a row major ordering, there's also a column major ordering. And this is used by some of the more traditional uh, mathematically oriented languages, uh, notably uh, Fortran, and also some of the numerical computing languages like uh, MATLAB and Octave, uh, relatives of each other, uh, and the R programming environment. Uh, in this case, instead of putting rows continuously, columns are put continuously, uh, in part because this is the model that Fortran laid out and codes that are written in MATLAB and Octave and R often rely upon older libraries that uh, Fortran uh, are implemented in Fortran, so they followed suit on that front. Uh, the reasons exactly why Fortran is a column-oriented language is uh, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but it probably had something to do with the early numerical applications it was used for uh, and this column major ordering fitting more naturally with that. At any rate, uh, instead of seeing 1, 2, 3 laid out contiguously in memory, you'd see 1, 4, 7, as in if you walked, uh, held a column consistent but increased the row number, you'd see those elements uh, in the one-dimensional embedding, uh, and then the 2, 5, uh, 8, and the 3, Six, nine, or now, the crafty folks uh, who are observing this thing and looking around at the very detailed so listings that are up here might notice that OCaml actually appears twice uh, in this listing. Uh, I enjoy OCaml a lot because the designers of that language were super smart and also super practical. In order to make their codes compatible with as wide array of programming libraries as possible, uh, the numerical matrices that they implement in there can actually be specified as in row major order or in column major order. Uh, the natural sort of 2D uh, built-in arrays are row major by default, but anything that you'll do with big data in there, you'll usually use a, a built-in library that OCaml provides, and that allows you to state when you make those uh, large-ish matrices, whether they should be able to laid out in the row major order, because you're going to perhaps interface with some C library uh, that needs that layout or, or laid out in column order instead because you're using some Fortran. Uh, so yet further evidence uh, of the wiseness of the OCaml folks. So uh, being aware of this aspect can increase your efficiency a little bit, but generally as we move forward since we're working in C, we're going to presume this row major ordering.
That leads to the next obvious question is like, when does this actually make a difference? So as our first exercise on that front, uh, they want to, you want to analyze uh, something that looks like the following, where you do a very simple operation on a 2D entity. In this case, a little 2D array called mat. And in this case, all I'm doing is presuming there are integers in this mat and summing up all of them. I'm going to use two different approaches uh, between the left hand side and the right hand side. There is a subtle difference between these two approaches in terms of the code, and it's your job for the next minute or two to figure out what that subtle difference is and decide whether or not it's going to affect the performance of these two at all. Take just a second, look carefully at these codes, determine the order that they're adding elements in, and speculate on whether this is going to make a difference in terms of performance. I'll pause here just for a moment. Cool, that should be enough time for those of you who really want to devote some time to this, to look and think, uh, and those who want to skip ahead to the answer. Here it is. On the left-hand side, the sum r business is named because this is a two-dimensional sort of entity uh, that is going to be summed uh, by rows first. And so what you'll see is that the outer loop here, in this pair of loops, it holds a row constant while changing a column with more frequency. So as I would work on row zero, uh, this i here will remain zero, and I'll march across the columns here, uh, looking at column zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc., all in row zero. And only then will this outer loop take over and start a new iteration of the inner loop, which starts at row one, looking at column zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. So this sums across rows, uh, and generally then would visit memory in the order of uh, a sort of row major uh, matrix. Uh, on the other hand, this sum C on the right-hand side just twists the uh, inner and outer loop around, um, inverts them so that uh, I'm holding a column fixed and changing a row. And this will mean then that as I look at column zero, I first walk down that column, uh, selling column zero, row zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all in column zero first, adding on to that, uh, and then ticking up the column to column one, and then working down uh, again, row zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, all the way uh, through column one, and go on like that until I sum all the elements in here. It too is summing up uh, this row-wise uh, matrix in C, but it's doing so in a column-wise fashion. Uh, and this is, as you suspect, the reason we're talking about this uh, is going to have an effect on the performance. And what you'll come to understand is that accessing things in a row-wise fashion, as is done on the left-hand side, uh, is actually much faster than accessing them on the column-wise fashion. Uh, so much so that if you were to time these two things uh, using uh, an appropriate timing mechanism, uh, what you'd see is that even with a mild amount of optimization uh, applied to that program, uh, you run that on a decent sized matrix like 50,000 rows by 10,000 columns. Uh, and what you'll find is that it takes about a quarter of a second uh, in the row rise, uh, row wise fashion uh, and almost five or yeah, about five times that uh, speed uh, in order to finish the column wise computation. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can't time this in that uh, way in, in a little while. Uh, so uh, let's look just quickly and make sure uh, my you know, CPU hasn't changed uh, very much on this front. Uh, in today's code pack is that matrix timing uh, dot C. Uh, so let me GCC and OG that. I'm actually gonna name the output uh, uh, matrix timing this time is matrix timing dot C. GCC that. And we can recreate the magic here. Uh, let's see, it was 50,000 uh, rows, yep, and 10,000 columns. Yep, and I'll do it. Uh, this might take a second because my crummy little laptop uh, takes a little while. Okay, so I may have run this on my desktop before, but if you're uh, seeing this at home, this isn't lag. Uh, it's actually crunching really hard right now on my uh, column-wise computation. So much so I might need to actually, okay, here we go. <laughs> 15 or so seconds uh, for the column-wise version and uh, uh, only a half second for the row-wise uh, fashion. Uh, so to that end, uh, this should be very convincing uh, that going across rows is more efficient. Now it's our goal to figure out why that is. Why is it that going, visiting um, the matrix in that order is so much more efficient? 
because any big O analysis of these two would conclude that this is uh, the same basic complexity between these two algorithms, that you're doing the same number of additions in both cases, uh, rows by columns here and columns by rows here. Uh, that's big O of R by C and big O of C by R, same basic complexity in that front. And so a theoretical analysis would conclude like there's no difference in terms of complexity between these two, but practically there's a very big difference in terms of how long they take. And this is because big O complexity throws out a few important features of modern CPUs, uh, that it's actually not a uniform access time to fish out pieces of memory here. That's one of the big simplifying assumptions of big O analysis, that it takes you the same amount of time to access one unit of memory, irrespective of where it is. This falls down in all practical situations in modern computing systems. And so we'll want to uncover why, so that you know uh, some of the pitfalls associated with it. So the first thing that we need to figure out, though, is just how you can go about timing things like this. Because unlike the timing experience we've done up to this point, I didn't affix any time uh, utility up here because it wouldn't do me any good. I actually want to time two different parts of this program. Uh, in the first case, I'm going to time summing across this row-wise version, and in the second case, I'm going to time some, uh, summing across uh, in a column-wise uh, fashion of this uh, matrix. Uh, and to do that, uh, you'll want to introduce a couple new concepts uh, and functions uh, associated with it. Uh, first, it should have been apparent based on our earlier timing experience that there are couple different ways to measure time on compute systems. Uh, and associated with it are these two different ways of calling and asking for times. The first and easiest way uh, is to ask, what's the time in the CPU right now? Uh, and this is going to be distinguished from the actual time in that uh, as I would run a program uh, like this one, uh, matrix timing, it's going to get some slice of time that's granted by the operating system, but if it runs for long enough, the operating system might actually put it on hold uh, and then wake it up again later uh, after the operating system has given other programs a chance to run for a short time. To that end, uh, this CPU time is going to measure just how long the um, the program is utilizing the CPU, and so it won't be charged for time that it's been put on hold by the operating system. Uh, the clock function uh, queries the hardware and the operating system to say, what's the time in the CPU right now? It doesn't do much good on its own, and so you think of this thing as a stopwatch, that you start it and then you stop it at a later point. Uh, the starting point doesn't do you much good until you subtract it off of from whatever your stopping point was. The difference between those two, along with a little math that's demonstrated down here, involving a cast to a double and then a division by a special constant, will convert this into a real amount of time and is exactly how the time up here is displayed as uh, 0 0.505 seconds. Uh, this is computed using that clock function. And we'll have a look at the source code for this in just a second. Now there's a second notion of time that's present in most computing systems because it's the notion of real world time. As in what time of day is it? Uh, I can do something and then get the time of day later and similarly do some subtraction there on so, uh, so do a little bit of arithmetic in order to calculate what's the wall time difference. Now the reason that we have these two different ones is again that it's not the case that the operating system is going to be running your program all the time, and in most performance settings will be more interested in the clock time over here. Generally, if a CPU and an OS is not loaded with very many programs, these two times, CPU time and real, uh, real or wall time, uh, they'll be very similar to each other. But depending on the operations, they can vary somewhat. Uh, for instance, some kinds of programs, uh, they take a lot more wall time than they do CPU time. Uh, for instance, a common example of this is the Ping program. Ping is a network communication program, uh, and its whole sort of purpose in the world is just to contact and see if a certain server is alive. So I can, for instance, uh, ping Amazon, uh, and if my internet up is up and, up and running, then I get little messages uh, from Amazon back and forth. Uh, primarily, uh, this kind of uh, activity uh, is used to determine uh, whether or not I have connectivity uh, to some server or not. But use it to demonstrate uh, the notion of times here. Uh, you should be at this point familiar with the time utility, which just measures program time. I run this thing, uh, and after a few seconds, I'll send it to Control-C to kill it. And you can see it used about three and a half seconds of real time, but 
almost no uh, actual CPU time. And that's because most of the time that this program spends uh, is waiting. Uh, it will send off a small packet over the network to Amazon uh, and then await its return. Uh, this doesn't need to occupy the CPU, so this program goes to sleep until it's woken up by the OS to say, hey, Amazon wrote you back to say it's still there. Uh, it took only uh, 46 or so milliseconds, uh, or is that microseconds? Yeah, I think it's milliseconds. It's usually uh, not milliseconds in these network stuff. Uh, and uh, to that end, I'm using almost no CPU to do that sort of set and receive. Most of the time is spent waiting, but uh, the program run here took me three and a half seconds. Uh, so that ends, there are lots of cases where a program might be put on hold for whatever reason, and so the real wall time here is going to exceed greatly the CPU time. Uh, if you can arrange for it and harness more than one core or CPU, you can actually get your CPU time to exceed wall time. So that's a subject for a different class entirely. Uh, for instance, an operating systems class, which will teach about how to develop multi-threaded programs. Our CSI 4061 actually touches on that, and so if you're looking forward to something, look forward to that later on down in the curriculum. So then, now that we have these two functions, CPU time and wall time, let's look very quickly just at how they're used within this program, uh, this matrix timing uh, business, uh, so that you can see a uh, sort of demonstrated use of them to measure two different parts of the program. Uh, this will be important sort of facets uh, to master uh, as you move forwards to the next project. Uh, so within here, then, uh, you have a bunch of um, uh, sort of options that uh, you can pass to, for instance, do only the row or only the column. We'll explore that in a later uh, point. Uh, but generally, this program lays out as follows. Uh, you have some of the rows and columns as given on the command line. Uh, you allocate a big old matrix uh, that's associated with that thing. Uh, we're going to do the one-dimensional layout of matrices, as we've talked about before, although I will give myself two-dimensional pointers into it. Uh, and in order to measure times, I'm going to establish a start and stop uh, using this clock T, usually just a big integer, uh, like a long, perhaps unsigned. And then also these time val structs, which are used by the get time of day function in order to determine what the wall time of day is. And right before I do any computations, I'm going to figure out what time of day is it right now, what time is the CPU uh, at, then go ahead and do my row summing and then stop the clock uh, for those two. Uh, and to that end, I just need to do a little bit of uh, arithmetic and I can report, this is how long it took me to do the row wise summing down here. Let me turn on my, uh, let's see, line, my high line so you can see where I'm at at a given moment. Uh, if I wanna repeat that as in uh, measure it against the column uh, business, uh, then it's just a wash, rinse, repeat. Uh, again, get the time of day as the starting point at this time uh, and the moment in the CPU, go about doing the column subbing uh, and then stop the two clocks, uh, clock here and get time of day here. Do the same arithmetic once again uh, and print out the results on that front. So uh, this is a standard paradigm to measure stuff. Whatever you want to measure goes in between here. Start a clock, uh, end a clock. Uh, start the, get the time of day uh, at the beginning, get the time of day at the end. Uh, and this can give you both a CPU time and a wall time measure for however long it takes things to do. Generally, we're going to be focused uh, from here on on CPU time. Uh, because it's going to reflect fairly closely what we are interested in, is in uh, how much CPU utilization we're going to use. And most of the programs we're going to write are going to be very compute intensive. They won't have uh, stalls uh, due to network operations or OS interruptions or that kind of stuff. And so the wall time is usually going to align fairly closely to it. So we'll mainly focus on clock stuff here. Uh, so, uh, oh, I should also mention uh, that this is sort of a primitive way to measure time. Uh, there are probably more sophisticated ways. And generally, other programming environments uh, that are higher up have timing functions where you can run some function within a time that sort of reports for you uh, an output for it. Uh, but this is good enough for the moment. And since it interacts fairly closely with the hardware to get hardware times, uh, it's reasonably accurate at the moment. And it's preferred Unix way to time things. So uh, with that in mind then, uh, we can at least measure time, but we are still not in a position uh, to understand why it is uh, exactly that this column wise uh, version goes so much slower, other than to draw on our intuition that it's you know, visiting memory in this sort of interesting pattern that's different. 
I want to bring back to that, uh, just to come back to this picture over here, uh, and that uh, one thing you'd want to understand is that the row-wise approach here is essentially just going to go across this entire array in order. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 29, and then 30 uh, to 59, and then 60 uh, to 89, and so forth. It's essentially the same uh, pattern of visiting the, the array as if you wrote a for loop from 0 to 3,000 uh, to visit as a one-dimensional entity. In contrast, the column-wise version, because this lays out as a row-wise entity, uh, means I'm going to hold my uh, column fixed and visit element 0, and then the next row down in uh, column zero, which is gonna be element 30, and then the next row down uh, element 60 and 90 and so forth. So essentially uh, scanning across each of these row pointers and fishing out the first element. After getting all the way up uh, to whatever it is like, uh, uh, 2,970 or something, uh, which is the, the last sort of uh, uh, element of the column, then we round back around, start visiting column one, which be elements one, 31, 61, 91, etc. When that's done, come back uh, and do two, 32, 62, 92, and so forth. And what we're driving at here is that there are jumps. Um, that every time I uh, am going to add up a column, I'm doing jumps from zero uh, forwards uh, consistently, and then one forwards by some uh, gap there. And we'll come to know that uh, space in between the elements in these columns as a stride, and can actually play around with a little bit more. And it should be intuitively then the case that if this goes slower due to that stuff, uh, due to the stride being uh, big versus in the going across the row, a stride of one means visit contiguous elements here. This should start to trigger and form a picture of like, I guess strides are bad. We'll want to formalize that more. Uh, but to tie that to hardware in some way, the first thing we need to do is to look at some more detailed performance information for this. So that end, uh, there is a second way that you can measure uh, performance that provides a lot more detail. And most systems have some performance monitoring tools. In particular, Linux uh, systems favor this tool called Perf. Uh, I'm not sure how widely available it is on your Windows or your Mac platforms, but on Linux, it's very easy uh, to acquire and usually pre-installed in most cases. Uh, on that note, you can run this matrix timing program on the only the row version and look at performance statistics and only the column version and look at performance statistics. Uh, so for instance, uh, if I come back to the shell over here, uh, we saw earlier that the uh, matrix timing thing, and I'm gonna decrease my size just a little bit here so that uh, this is a little more reasonable uh, to wait for. I can say only run the row version uh, like this and I get uh, hardly any time uh, versus if I run the column version, it takes you know, somewhat more time on, on that front. And so what you can do with this perf program is actually plug in uh, something that looks sort of like this where I'll run the column version. And this thing's gonna spit out a, uh, let's see, uh, well, hang on a second. I'm forgetting like what the proper invocation is. And uh, for those following on home, uh, this is in the code pack. I have a little script to automate this uh, for me. Uh, what do I need to do? Uh, let's see. Perf, 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 uh, perf. Oh, I have to ask for stats and so forth uh, and pass a bunch of stuff in, that, which I'm not going to bother to do because these are all of the performance statistics that I want to capture. We may as well just run this script right now. Uh, essentially, it builds up the whole lot of options to pass to perf uh, down here uh, and then runs matrix timing uh, under it. Um, so to that end, let me just uh, run this shell scripts uh, measure cache, uh, which is going to spit out a bunch of results for us on here, uh, uh, courtesy of perf. Uh, and you can see there's a whole wide array of things you can ask for from perf where these aren't even uh, the, the sum of all of them. Uh, but essentially we're asking for a bunch of performance statistics that we'll talk about in some more detail later. Uh, the running both here gives me some timings here, uh, but running just rows in this case uh, under perf gives me uh, these interesting statistics that we'll look at in a slide in just a second. Uh, I can then rerun the program using column mode here, uh, get times, uh, but then also get much more detailed information about what's happening in the underlying hardware. And so if you advance uh, to the next slide, the next task that I have for you, and this will be our closing exercise for the lecture, is to look at this girth of information and see if you can make any sense of it. Uh, some of the numbers over here are quite large, 
And each of them is augmented with a description over here of the particular statistic that is being gathered at the hardware level about what's happening. Uh, over here are some comments, and you can generally ignore these uh, percentages over here. They correspond to when it is during the programming run or how percentage of the time uh, these things are sampled. Uh, it's the case that when you're measuring hardware stuff, you can't always measure everything all the time. So these report how frequently uh, or how much of the time during the program we're actually able to look at this stuff. So focus your attention instead uh, on this middle stuff and see if you can make heads or tails of what the labels are down here and you compare numbers between the top row-wise stuff and the bottom column-wise stuff to see if anything jumps out as, ah, this is probably where the differences are being made. Uh, have at it for just a few minutes, game, and then we'll pick right back up. So if you didn't pause, now is your last chance. Here's uh, what I would take away from this. First, there's some sort of obvious things in here. Uh, for instance, the little comment here that Perf pushes out indicates that there's a 3.09 ints per cycle. And if you look over here at the label of instructions, this is supposed to sort of indicate to you that, oh, I'm getting about three instructions per cycle. And this is pretty good. Uh, it's uh, again an illustration that the hardware that we're running on here uh, it has these pipeline and superscalar features, which means that I'm not limited to a single instruction per cycle. Uh, that by dispatching things uh, into uh, the superscalar features of the processor, uh, we can actually get multiple results uh, per cycle. Uh, and while I executed uh, only 135,000 some cycles, I got 417 or 135 million in, uh, cycles. I got 417 million or so instructions executed. Uh, and that's a favorable ratio of more than one instruction per cycle executed. That's good. Uh, compare that down here to the piddly one instruction per cycle I get from the columnized version, and you can start to see performance differences. Like, okay, if I'm only able to eke out one instruction per cycle, I'm gonna need more cycles. More cycles means more time, means like this is slower in general to execute. So that's a good place to start, uh, but it doesn't really explain much of why it is that I'm getting fewer instructions per cycle uh, down in the bottom versus up in the top in the row-wise fashion. So the next things you might start comparing are these lower down numbers. Uh, and one thing I think it is uh, natural to look at is misses. Misses are universally acknowledged to be bad. Uh, and while there are three million some misses uh, associated with uh, this first row-wise fashion portion, and this might seem like a lot, uh, there's a handy uh, hint over here that this is only 6% or so of all of the decash uh, loads, uh, whatever that means. Uh, decash, uh, which is mentioned up here, apparently it's getting hit 56 uh, million some times, uh, but only a fraction of those are, are associated with misses. And this is where the real difference uh, starts uh, to play out. Uh, that instead down here in the L1D cache loads, there's some more in this column-wise version, but there's a hell of a lot more misses. As in 63% of the time I was trying to loading, I'm missing. Uh, and whatever these things are, missing can't be good. And to that end, uh, this is probably bad. Uh, so here is a clear sign that if we can figure out what these cache misses are, they're probably what is explaining the lack of performance uh, that we're seeing on the columnwise portion uh, versus the rowwise portion. There's some other things that are mentioned here, uh, cache references and cache misses and so forth. Uh, the uh, sort of statistics that might pick a, a fish out right here are like, oh, I've only got a 5% uh, miss rate on these caches. Uh, unfortunately, I have a whole lot more cache references uh, than I do up here. Uh, that seems like it might be good or bad. It's hard to say, but uh, we'll focus our attention mostly on the misses here, which are, are, are not good. And the fact that this is many more probably means that we're going farther out in the cache. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, we're gonna leave with a little bit of a mystery. But essentially, what we'll need to sort out is exactly what are these decache misses? And why is it that the columnwise version is doing so much worse uh, than the rowwise version? Uh, to that end, that conversation is going to lead us to discuss the memory hierarchy. That it is usually sort of pictured as this big pyramid. Uh, at the top are some memory elements that we're well familiar with at this point. 
there are those 16 registers that you have in your CPU. And irrespective of what computing platform you're working on, usually the uh, CPU has a very limited number uh, in the you know dozens uh, of registers uh, that it can make use of, but they are blindingly fast and are the most immediately accessible uh, data elements that you can get to the CPU. Sitting just beneath that is usually a fairly fast uh, uh, area of memory known as cache uh, that's usually on chip with the CPU. Uh, and if you can keep most of your computational data in that area, you tend to speed up and go relatively quickly. But if you're missing that uh, and having to go farther out, you may end up in slower main memory. Uh, the sizes of those things increase in that there are only 16 64-bit registers. Uh, that's 16 uh, by 16 by 8 bytes. So that's some, um, uh, what is that, paltry 128 bytes or something like that of memory that's fast for the, the, uh, the CPU. Cache, on the other hand, is usually measured in the kilobytes to megabytes range versus DRAM, uh, this bigger store of memory is measured in the gigabytes, but is uh, several fat orders of magnitude slower to access. So we'll want to start having a look at this pyramid of memory and how it is that things make their way in between them. Uh, we'll leave off for now with that, but if you're curious, you can start poking ahead in the slides, uh, which feature some more discussion of the memory hierarchy and good code patterns that will exploit uh, all of the fastness that you can get out of it. I'll see you guys next time, and hopefully you'll have a chance to join me for the lecture discussion uh, tomorrow. So happy hacking until then.